Well, this week I had a very interesting experience. I almost choked to death. <laughs> I know, I know. Your eyes are wide, my eyes were wider, I promise you. I was actually having coffee with Heather, and we were having a beautiful conversation about God's goodness and looking at the future and plans. And as I'm sitting there, I thought I was going to burp. And as I burped, it wasn't a burp. It was a little bit of puke. I'm sorry to be horrible and disgusting, but that's just the reality of the situation. And as I puked, I thought, I don't want to be rude in front of my guest and puke all over the carpet. <laughs> so I'm sorry to be so horrible. I'm opening with a preach about something disgusting. But this is the truth. As I puked, I, thought, I kept my mouth closed and I didn't let it come out. And I thought, let me quickly run to the bathroom. I was surprised by this. I didn't feel sick. I wasn't sick. It, but as I started to get up to run to the bathroom, I swallowed a little bit. And as I swallowed a little bit, it got stuck, not in my esophagus, but in my airways. I must have, in the panic and the shock and the embarrassment in front of my guest, I breathed it in and blocked my airways in, in the worst way possible. So as I get to the bathroom, I realize I'm not breathing. It took me a couple seconds to realize, oh, you're, you're not breathing. I, I went like this, and as I, oh, nothing came in. Everyone just go, and thank God that you were able to do that. Because as I tried to breathe in, there was no oxygen. And I took a second attempt at breath. And as I took that second, <gasps> nothing was exchanging. There was no life in the air that was abundantly available around me that could intoxicate my lungs with oxygen. <laughs> there was nothing of the exchange that was abundantly available because I had a blockage. And as I'm hunched over the sink, trying to gasp for oxygen, trying to get out the blockage, I looked up into the mirror and I saw my own eyeball. <laughs> as Sammy says, my eyeballs. I don't know, have you ever seen your, obviously you've all seen your own eyes, but do you ever seen what's behind your eyes? That's really who you are. Your eyeball is not who you are. Your soul behind that, coupled with your spirit, is who you really are. And I had an experience when I was in my early 20s of looking at my eye and I looked through my eye into my soul and I heard God's voice. And the voice of the Lord said, are you ready for a blessing? He said to me, Sean, you're going to die one day. And it shocked me. It shocked me to the point where I shook physically. It, there was so much fear of the Lord that came over me. I shook physically and fell to the floor. And for 10 or 15 minutes, I had, to, I had to take that amount of time to recover because of the gravity of what God said to me. Because at that age, I was just living like I would live forever. That I had all the potential and all the opportunity and whatever I did made no difference. And I wasn't accessing the life of God. And so he had to shock me into saying, hey, you've got a certain amount of time on this planet. You're going to be dead very, very soon. Oh, I'll be 100. Well, 100 is a small amount of time. It's a tiny amount of time. I just got to 40, and I realized I'm only starting to figure out some things at the age of 40. I spent the first 40 years thinking I knew it all. Now I'm realizing I knew very little. <laughs> and so the voice said to me, you're going to die, and it changed my life. And the second encounter now, 20, almost 20 years later, is this week. I saw my own soul, and I looked into the mirror, and I said to myself, this wasn't God. I just said to myself, Oh, so this is how you're going to die. <laughs> my brother understands my humor, so he's laughing. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, <laughs> that's what I thought. And you know what? I didn't say it in fear. I thought I said it in amusement. Like, oh, oh, this is it. I heard that voice 20 years ago. I'm hearing it again. This is how you die. Anyway, I kept on struggling for breath. And eventually after a very long period of about five seconds, I caught my breath again. And it was a minuscule amount of breath. And it took me another minute to get my blockage removed so I could breathe properly. Everyone go, thank God. Thank God. You need to lose that breath for 30 seconds and it'll wake you up to how powerful that is. So, I told you that story for sympathy, so that you could feel sorry for me, you could check up on my health, no, no, no. I told you that story because in that moment, I realized something. 
I realize that each of us as believers, those who are highly favored of the Lord, we have an abundance of His blessing all around us. Much like the oxygen in the atmosphere right now. We have an abundance of His goodness that He has placed there on purpose to bless us. You enjoying breathing, Judah? <laughs> and in that abundance... If you come up against resistance and blockages and death and destruction and allow that to take hold, it can create a separation between that which God wants to bless you with and your need for life. It can just block that and stop that. So whilst I'm looking at my eyeballs in the mirror, I'm going, I know oxygen is just, just here. It's actually already in my mouth. But this little thing that's stopping that life flow, it's going to kill me. I'm amazed at how many people, both, both believers and unbelievers, can walk around this planet not breathing spiritually. Yeah. I don't know how people get through life not killing themselves or not getting into alcoholic and drug addictions. I don't know how people don't become really, really weird if they don't have access to God and access that they're accessing. I don't know how they do it because I can barely do it and I've got access to God. And I know God. I can hear His voice. It is, you know, people have such incredible willpower and a robust uh, ability just to keep on trucking. It's amazing. Amazing. The next time you look at a drug addict, don't go, oh, you stupid idiot. Go, you're, how are you still alive? You're in such a predicament and yet you still exist. It's like they've got a blockage, but they just keep on going. Like dead men walking around. Like, this is impressive. If you see dead people walking around, you should be impressed. Wow! <laughs> this is the zombie apocalypse. In, uh, but that's what, it's like. that's what really is happening. There are people who are not accessing the life of God, and yet they function on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, what's better than functioning on a day-to-day -day basis with blockages is to learn how to breathe in His life and access that easily, just as natural as it is for you to take a breath. That's as supernatural as it is for you to take a heavenly breath. And it should just be something that's automatic and natural. What stops that is something external, something artificial that comes in and blocks that access between you and God, that life flow. So this morning, we're going to look at three or four things, depending on how far we get, that block God's life flow in your life. Who wants to breathe easy? I want to breathe easy. Just thinking about that just makes me want to breath. Breath, breathe. <laughs> Choking hazard. A choking. We're looking at the choking hazard. If you stay away from choking ha hazards, you will automatically breathe. If you just stay away from blockages, what the way that God planned it will just work automatically. Babies with no experience, no university educations, no hard work ethic, no 40 years of going through the desert and figuring things out, no counsel and wisdom from the Lord, with no certificates whatsoever, Not, can't even speak English or Chinese. They come out of the womb and naturally they just start breathing. And that's what it is spiritually speaking. When we become born again, it is an automatic reaction to our nature that we start breathing. There's something artificial that comes in and blocks that, that stops that. You do not have to teach a Christian how to breathe. Just like you don't have to teach a baby how to breathe. It is an automatic response to life. What's being taught to Christians is something artificial that blocks their breathing. Because if you can control their breathing, I would do anything in that moment to get my life back. So I'll chop off my arm. So some people are very rich with arms and eyeballs and legs. <laughs> Religious people. Because they're getting payment for your life. And they usually wear dog collars. Or they usually wear the big white suit at the front. Or they're very dominating, very religious. And they become the access point between you and God. Well, that's just not supernatural. That's just not natural. That's not the way God designed it. God designed it for you to have direct access. Anytime you get something external, it is religion, it is devilish, and it will bring death into your life. Uh, we're going to look at some of those blockages today. 
And as revelation starts to bubble and boil, you're going to see that sometimes you've relied on things that are blockages, not blessings. And it's very easy to dispel that. Just breathe more. <laughs> and as you breathe more, that stuff will get out of your system. Somebody say amen. amen. I want to breathe more. Let's bring up our first, first, first scripture, Heather. This is Colossians 2. And in Colossians, we are going to see some of the blockages that were dealt with by Christ, by what He did. And, how, and as we look at how He approached them, you're going to see that those are no longer issues unless you make them issues. They are no longer uh, airways that you have to suffer through restriction and religion, but that God actually opened up these airways so you could breathe easy. But if you don't see this, some people can trick you and deceive you. If you look a few verses before where this is referenced, there's a hollow deception that comes in to stop those airways working. So you need to, Rob has shared this many times, the way to teach somebody about the counterfeit is not to give them counterfeit banknotes. It's to give them real banknotes. And once you feel the real, when you encounter something that's counterfeit, you recognize it as, oh, this is not normal. And so we're not meant to discover the lies of the enemy and how he operates. And our whole lives are not meant to be dominated by understanding what the blockage is. Our lives are meant to be liberated by understanding what truth is. When you look at truth, it's easy to identify what the lie is. And so don't really worry about the devil too much and what he's doing. You know, we shouldn't be unaware of his schemes. And there are schemes. So there's a place for that. The main thing is we should understand what is the proper airways. When you operate by the proper airways, it's easy to identify what the devil's schemes are and the blockages. So this is a clear um, portrayal of what Jesus did to undo those blockages. In Jesus, you were also circumcised with a circumcision not performed by human hands. So a little context, just in case, I know most people will know this. Circumcision was a Jewish ritual or rite that happened eight days after birth, if you were really, really holy, if you were really good. That was the prime way to do it, is that you would give the little boy a snip on the tip, and that was a sign that he was Jewish and that he had a covenant with God. And so Paul is writing here, and he's saying, I want to give you an elevated idea, a, a, a revealed idea of what circumcision really is. Circumcision isn't something that's done in the natural to little eight-year-old, eight-day-old boys. It's done supernaturally, not with the hands of man. Meaning that you and I can't perform true heavenly circumcision. You don't have a part in the circumcision process. Even in the natural, can you imagine an eight-day-old boy going, Mommy, Daddy, uh, can you please circumcise me, please? I want to be really holy. They had no idea what circumcision was, eight, eight days old. Unless you're really, really, really clever. It was something external that was done to you. And you didn't want it done, to be honest. You didn't know about it. It was something ex uh, external done, but human hands were able to do it. Supernaturally speaking, when we become born again, God circumcises us with His hands. And it's not the circumcision done in the natural, physically. It's a spiritual circumcision of the heart. He does it, not we do it. You need to see that because if you think that you can become more circumcised by your works or by what you do, it is a blockage that will restrict the flow of life in your flow of His life in your life. So a circumcision not performed by human hands. Your whole self ruled by the flesh or by your sinful nature. We'll explain that in a second. Was put off when you were circumcised by Christ. When you were separated from the life of God in first Adam because he sinned. You became sinful. And your sin proved that you were sinful. Your, your sin didn't make you sinful. It just proved that you were already sinful because Adam sinned. And therefore, all in Adam sinned. We all come from Adam. Our great, 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 great granddaddy is Adam. Just like if your granddad was Chinese, you are Chinese. When you eat noodles 
and speak Cantonese, that is a proof that you're Chinese. You eating noodles and speaking Cantonese doesn't make you Chinese. I can eat all the noodles I want. Doesn't make me Chinese, right? But you who are Chinese, when you eat noodles, prove that you are already Chinese. Does that make sense? Just like when fat Americans eat hamburgers, it proves that they were, no. no. Um, so you, was separated from the life of God. You had blockages in your lungs. You could not access His goodness, His favor, His blessing. And when Christ came along, He took your sinfulness, who you are by nature, objects of wrath, it says. And it took, takes who you are, and it circumcises it, which means to cut that off and give you a covenant with God. But you don't do it. He does it. So He takes your to use my stupid analogy, he takes your Chineseness, takes it away, and gives you Christianness. He takes your Americanness away and gives you Christianness. You become a believer, born again. I am not, I don't know what I am, Chinese, I'm not, I'm not Chinese, obviously, but uh, I like to think of myself as a Hong Konger. But I'm not African, I'm not European, I'm not American, I'm not Chinese, I'm not British. I am a believer. That's my citizenship, primarily. Why? Because I worked hard enough to become? No, because he did it. I, I, I'm laboring this, and I know most people in this room know this, but there's a consequence to knowing this. When you see this by revelation, it stops you playing with blockages and helps you just to breathe. And so I don't mind laboring something that's boring if it means your airways are clean. You were circumcised by Christ, and you have been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through your faith in the working of God. Whose work? God's work. How do you access his work? By faith. You don't do the working, he does the working. You just receive it as a free gift. Because it's not human hands who can circumcise your heart. And God uh, raised him from the dead. If God raised Christ from the dead, and you were in Christ, and you were co-crucified with Christ, then who raised you from the dead? God. You were raised with Christ from the dead. If God supplied the power to make you born again, then God continues to supply the power to keep you born again. So this is why Christians go, if I sin, I'm going to lose relationship with God. I'm going to lose my connection. And if I sin for too long, I might lose my salvation. That's a blockage to the life. Now you're in fear. Now you're in debt. Now you think that death is coming, knocking at your door because you sinned. Well, how do you get rid of sin, Christian? How do you, how do you get out of sin? Try really hard? Memorize the Ten Commandments? Apologize to everyone? 12-step program? How do you get rid of sin? It's a simple answer. You don't. He does. And Todd's absolutely right. Not only does he, he did. At the cross 2,000 years ago, he got rid of your sin and your sin nature. He, got, he dealt with it. Oh, but I still sin. We're going to look at that in a second. I promise you. But in your spirit, who you are, God has already made you alive with Christ. He already raised you from the dead. The main blockage that we have between us and the life of God is death. And the consequence of death is debt and something else. The main consequence is, is debt. And if you're in debt, then you're going to be worried about the debt collector who we interpret as the devil. Because if you're in debt, you owe that legitimately. And who's going to knock on your door but the devil and remind you of the debt that you owe and maybe break your knees in the process? That's a huge blockage. So it's not good enough to go, thank you, Jesus, that you saved me when I got saved, whenever, it were, whenever you got saved, five years ago, ten years ago. Thank you, Jesus, that I've been saved for 40 years. But now I need to get rid of sin in my life. 
No, when, he, when you were saved, you were not just cleaned up to that point in your life, and then it was up to you to keep yourself clean. You didn't become more moral the day that you saved. You weren't empowered to now perform the law better. That's not what happened. I, I love this quote. It says, Jesus didn't die to make bad men good. Jesus died to make dead men alive. When you got saved, you went from spiritual death to spiritual life. And what that spiritual death in life is, is separation from God, being in sin, and having the devil give, have opportunities to attack you and accuse you. You went from that to spiritual life, where sin doesn't count against you anymore. Even when you sin, sin does not count against you. The devil has... Hey, amen! I, I, I know when I say this, people are going, they're waiting for the but. They're waiting for the but. There is no but. When you sin, God does not count your sins against you. How, how can he count your sins against you? How can he count your sins against you? If you died and were made alive with Christ, is he counting the sins against Christ? Then he can't count sins against you because now you're in Christ. You were raised with Christ. You weren't raised by yourself again like you were. You are now raised with Christ. We're going to look at that in more depth. It's easy to nod your head on a Sunday. It's very hard on a Wednesday night when you go to your Bible study with all your very super spiritual friends and they go, the wages of sin is death. And when you sin, you open the door to the devil. It sounds so convincing, but it'll block the life of God. It's deceit. So this is why we're looking at truth so we can feel what the real is, so we don't get deceived by the counterfeit. Having been buried with him in baptiz ba baptism, in which you were also raised with him through your faith in the working of God, the working of God, the working of God, who raised him from the dead. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, this is before you were saved, before you were a believer. When you were in your sin and the death of the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. Watch this. You can't get around this in the Bible. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. There's no other way to interpret this. And there's many, 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 many other Christi uh, scriptures in both the New and Old Covenant to confirm this. Watch this. He forgave us all our sins. Everybody say that together. He forgave us all our sins. He forgave us all our sins. You can't get around that. There's no way to interpret that with some, uh, 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 with any truthfulness, unless you are trying to fight some other agenda, some other deceitful scheme to keep people in religion. He forgave us all our sins. He forgave us all our sins. When the next time a religious Christian says to you, or even a well-meaning Christian who's he's not he's not trying to be religious, but they are propagating blockages. You need to say to them, how do you interpret uh, Colossians 2 when it says, God forgave us all our sins? Just, that's, that's simple. Just, well, you know, um, you know he, he did forgive your sins on the cross, but then now you, if you keep on sin, watch them squirm and just go back to, well, what does it mean when it says, he forgave us all our sins? When your own mind is accusing you to say, oh, look, you sinned. You deserve the punishment for that sin. You need to say to your own self, your own soul, what does it mean in Colossians 2 when it says he forgave us all our sins? What does that mean? That's the truth. Black and white truth. Now, it's going to go deeper in a second. He forgave us all our sins. Look at this. Having canceled the charge of legal indebtedness. Any debt that you had, we looked at last week, any debt that you had, he canceled your debt. How could he cancel your debt? You were sinful. He canceled your debt because he forgave you all your sins. Can you pay God back? No, you can't pay him back because he forgave you. What was the foundation for him forgiving you? The fact that the debt was paid. 
He didn't forgive you because he's a nice guy, although God is a nice guy, and because he wanted to just give you a gift and he just sort of put a big X on the debt and just canceled it willy-nilly. The reason he was able to forgive you your sins and cancel the debt is because the debt was paid in full. When was the debt paid in full? When Jesus spilled his blood. So when Christ is sacrificed as the perfect lamb of God, he pays for your debt. That's how you're able to be on the cross. The same cross that he was sacrificed on, you were sacrificed on. Because that debt was paid. If you don't see that, you are going to keep on asking the question, oh, does my sin count? Is God counting my sin? Is he against me? Is he going to send the devil against me? Or maybe he doesn't send the devil, but maybe the devil has a right because I did sin. Your sin can't be counted against you because he paid the debt in full. Thank you, Jesus. Ask a question. I go to the cash register and I pull out $100. I steal it whilst my boss is not looking, put it in my back pocket and go home. Still got the $100 in my back pocket. Have I sinned or not? The question is not <laughs> do we do bad things. Everyone knows. Just open your eyes and look in the mirror every second day. You'll see. The question is, was that debt paid for at the cross? How can you be certain that it was paid for? You can only be as certain as that debt was paid for to the degree that you've seen Jesus sacrificed on the cross. If you've seen Jesus on the cross, and if you believed that he went to the cross and he spilled his blood, then you have to believe at the equal same amount of conviction that when he died on the cross, that that death was to pay for your sins. If you think that the sin, with the $100 still in my pocket, it could just be still in my hand. I could still have the blood from my murder victim on my hands. If you believe that Jesus didn't pay for that sin, then just out of logic, you must say that he didn't go to the cross. Because when he went to the cross, he paid for that sin. What was the purpose of his spilling his blood? This, is not, this does not make logical sense to the human mind. This is not something you can figure out by some Hollywood writer who comes up with a script. This is, God did something that is way above our thinking. He sacrificed himself to pay the debt. So the outworking of his sacrifice is that when I sin, I know he's already paid for it. If I'm going to sin, if I tell you all, okay, guys, tomorrow I'm going to the cash register, I'm going to the bank and I'm going to steal a million dollars. Do you know that even though I've confessed that and I've said I'm going to do it and you all know and I have premeditated intention to steal a million dollars and let's kill three people at the same time. Well, you've all heard me say that. When I walk into the bank, I go bang, 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 give me the million dollars, I walk out. Before I committed that atrocity, that sin was already paid for. That is offensive to humanity. Because how dare someone do that? And yet Jesus paid for all the sins of the whole world. Every sin that's ever been committed. Every rape, every murder, every act of pedophilia. He's already paid for that evil, disgusting behavior. He's already paid for it. If you don't believe that, then you, if you think there's a limit to what he's paid, then number one, it's an insult to Jesus. Because you're saying his blood isn't powerful enough. His working isn't strong enough. And number two, you think that at some point that power is going to run out. And where does it run out? At what point is it not good enough to pay for your sin? Everyone's going quiet. Is, is it because I'm laboring at the same point or is it because it's making you think? What is it? <laughs> no. 
Yeah, yeah, go for it, Todd. Go, go for it. Yes. Yeah. So just for the camera, Todd is saying that uh, the logical argument is what, not what saved him. It was the revelation and the meeting of the Holy Spirit that made that real. So Amen. Presented. Right. Yeah. Oh, a hundred percent. This is a hundred percent work of the Holy Spirit. It's called regeneration. He, he makes you alive. Yeah. Without the Holy Spirit, there's no. Yeah. Yes. So, so here's the thing. Revelation operates a hundred percent through the Spirit. Sometimes the blockages need to be because they are human blockages. They are logical blockages that we enforce externally. The life of God is natural. It'll flow automatically. You don't need human understanding to get to the life of God. But sometimes you need human understanding to undo the human blockages that we put on ourselves. And then as we look at that, we go, oh, yeah, that's stupid. That forces us then to go, oh, I can't trust in this. What do I? Oh, God. And then it's just that natural interaction. So we, we can't actually propagate revelation. All we can do is undo human corruption, <laughs> and even that it needs the spirit, the spirit's help. Um, so I'm not, I'm not trying to. Uh, the Holy Spirit is the one who preaches these messages to us. But when we look at the human blockages, we go, "Oh, that doesn't make sense." I believe it here, but not fully over there. There needs to be a, an integrity in our understanding. But I, I do take the point you're saying. Did you want to say something? So we've still got the $100 in our pocket. What do we do from that point? Here's the thing that most Christians will tell you. You need to repent. You need to say sorry to God. You need to get right in your relationship again because that sin broke your relationship. This is what they say. It's not true. Sin cannot break your relationship with God. Because if your relationship with God was dependent on you not sinning, then how did you get saved? You get saved through Jesus. And you're kept saved through Jesus. It's the working of God that saves you. And it's the working God that keeps you saved. So when I steal 100 bucks, that doesn't break my relationship with God. It may feel like that because I've been taught that. The devil may come along and lie to me, and I believe the lies of the devil. But that's not true. The truth is, the truth is Jesus. And Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. If our way is opened by Jesus, then no amount of sin can stop the way being opened. Because whilst we were in death and the uncircumcision of our sinful nature, God made us alive with Christ. So the question then becomes from a religious point of view, and we've all been conditioned in this. We've all got this question in us, which is, oh, well, I can just keep on sinning then? That's exactly the question that's asked in Romans 6. The Roman, end of Romans 5 says, uh, where sin abounded, grace did all the more abound. God's gift, God's, God's favor independent of your bad actions. And so where, where you get a little bit of sin, you get more grace. When you get a lot of sin, you get even more grace, is what Paul's saying in Romans 5. Beginning of Romans 6, verse 1, it says, So what shall we say then? That we should sin more, that grace may abound more? Most Christians have never asked that question. Have you ever asked that question? Okay, well, if my sin doesn't break my relationship with God and I'm still perfectly righteous, should I just keep on sinning? Most Christians haven't asked that. Because they haven't seen great grace at such a depth that they've seen that that is even a possibility. Most Christians get saved and get told you need to now act right in order to maintain your righteousness. You cannot maintain your righteousness because it's not your righteousness. He maintains his own righteousness and you receive it by faith. So I can sin 
And it doesn't break my relationship because my relationship was never dependent on what I did in the first place. That is shocking to religion. Religion then loses its grip. It loses its power because religion says we are the keepers of the way on how to get to God. And they lose their power. It's power. It's devilish. So they don't like that. But that is the truth. My sin doesn't stop my relationship with God. Let me say it a different way. My sin doesn't stop God's relationship with me. God never sinned, so he doesn't lose a relationship with me. In Christ. Only in Christ. Not in Buddha. Not in Adam. Not in Moses. Not on yourself. Only in Christ do you have that access. Let's go back to that slide, Heather. I know it sounds, to some people it'll sound like heresy what I'm saying. Just read the scriptures in context. Read Romans 3, 4, 5. Get up to chapter 6 before those que- there's two questions that are asked about should we just keep on sinning? Read all of that in context. And as you see the scripture in its truth, you have to say, did God forgive me or didn't he forgive me? And to what extent? And then what's my part to play in the equation? We'll go a little deeper in that in a moment. So he forgave us all our sins, having canceled our legal debt, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. If you see the cross, you must see your sins are forgiven. And then the first consequence of death or not seeing that you died in Christ or were raised uh, raised to life, is that you don't see that your debt has been paid in full. The second consequence is he disarmed the powers and authorities. He disarmed the devil. The devil has no right to attack you because he disarmed them. Jesus disarmed them. If you still think that you're in debt, it's because you didn't see your death. If you still think that the devil is not disarmed, it's because you didn't see your debt was paid. There's a sequence there. You have to see your death in life to see that you've been not in debt anymore. You've been credited with righteousness. And then because you see that, you then see the devil has been disarmed. He has no right to accuse you. We read it last week. Colossians 1 verse 22-ish says that we are presented holy in his sight, free from accusation. If you're feeling accused, if you're a believer and you are feeling accused, it's not from God. Because why would God disarm the enemy who wants to accuse you? He's called the accuser. That's what Satan is. Why would he disarm him if he still wants you to be accused? No, he took away his power to accuse you. How did he take away the power? He paid the debt. Why did he pay the debt? Because he died on your behalf. If you see the cross, you must see that you're forgiven and you see the enemy has no right to accuse you. Condemnation is not from the spirit. It's from Satan. If you, build, if you feel bad for the sin that you've done, it's because you haven't seen that the sin has been paid for in full. And if we're honest, if we just take this, thank you, Heather, we can take that down. If you just look at this, if you feel bad for three days and then feel a little bit better, was that the working of God? Or was it just you and your memory? If your guilt only lasts for three days, it's not... It's not a godly type of guilt, because godly guilt lasts for eternity. (laughs) So here's the thing. A Christian will say, you need to repent of your sin, right? You say, sorry to God, and everything's great. That's what they say. At the same time, you still wreaked havoc in the world, because you stole money from somebody, and you still have the $100. Now, actually, what rectifies that situation is giving back the $100, if you can. Okay. You've got to see your death, to see your debts being paid, to see that the devil has stood accused. He stood and condemned himself, and he has no right to accuse you. Does that make sense? Okay. There's a lot to process. Did you notice the words in Colossians 2 that says legal indebtedness? There is a legal obligation for that debt to be paid. It's not just on a whim. There is a court system in heaven 
that accounts for sin and accounts for death, that accounts for wrongs and it accounts for rights. And so you can't just get around this debt. God doesn't cancel it on a whim himself. He paid the price to cancel it. Okay, so there is a system that's in place in heaven, but there's also a reflection of that system on earth called the law. And the law is the perfect, holy, righteous requirements that God had for an individual to have perfect relationship to be considered righteous with him. But Romans 3 says we all fell short of the glory of God for all sin. So we have this problem now. We have the sin problem where we sinned in first Adam. Our sin confirmed that we were sinners. And we have a separation from God. We're in death. So Jesus comes along and rescues us from our own death. He comes and rescues us, right? Now the question then becomes in the new covenant, all of the letters, most of the letters in the new covenant are answering the question, well, are we still under the law? The law which was purposed to show us that we're in sin, that we needed a savior. Are we still under the law? So when you sin, a good well-meaning Christian and maybe even your own self will say to you, well, I did wrong. I've got to make this right. I've got to do something to make this right. What that is, it is a reflection of the law, of the Mosaic law, which is the perfect righteous requirements, holy. So now I've got to do something to rectify the situation. The emphasis is taken off what Jesus did, and it's put back onto you. Every time the emphasis is put on you, you know you are not living in the grace of God. You're living in legalism. It's not that you don't do things. You can do things. You can do amazing things. It's just that is the emphasis on his power or your power, his work or your work. And so we're going to look at this distinction. And Paul is arguing here that you are no longer under the supervision of the law, that you are no longer uh, married to something that was controlling of you. Yeah. Okay. Romans 7. Do you not know, brothers and sisters, for I am speaking to those who know the law, the law of Moses. He says that the law has authority over someone as long as that person lives. You know, when we drove, uh, Bonnie and I, when American 2019, when you drive through the, th- the th- southern states, often on the highways, you'll have the Ten Commandments. Often. Someone's paid for advertising the Ten Commandments. And they really love advertising the Ten Commandments. They believe, a lot of southern Americans believe that we are still under the law because they think that by focusing on the law, we become more righteous. That's what they believe. And they really, they genuinely believe it. It's a good motive because the law is holy, because the law is right, because it points out that all the things that are wrong. And the law was instituted by God, remember? The law has authority over someone as long as that person lives. If you die, the Hong Kong police are not going to come and arrest you. Even if you were guilty of a thousand things, the second you die, it no longer has authority over you. Does that make sense? For example, by law, a married woman is bound to her husband as long as he is still alive. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law that binds her to him. So if Bonnie was married to me, and she is, if I died, she is no longer the wife of Sean. Yep. That's a legal, contractual, covenantal relationship. So then, if she has sexual relations with another man whilst her husband is still alive, she is called an adulteress. So if Bonnie was at home today, not looking after Sammy, but with some other man, we would all go, adulteress! She's wrong. What she's doing is bad. But if her husband dies, if I died, she is released from that law and is not an adulteress if she marries another man. Would anyone complain if when I died, because I did the bank robbery and they shot me instead, and next year Bonnie got married to another man? You would never call her an adulteress, right? She's legally released from an obligation to me as her husband. All makes sense. This is a humanistic argument, Paul. He actually says, I'm writing to you in human terms. 
So, my brothers and sisters, you also died to the law. Paul swaps, flips it here. He's saying that that covenantal relationship has value and authority. And if the husband dies, she is released. Now he says, no longer... Um, the husband didn't die. Remember uh, Matthew, seven, uh, Matthew 5, 17. says, Jesus said, the law will never pass away. Don't think that I've come to cancel the law. I've come to fulfill it. So a lot of Christians say, see, the law is still in play. Because Jesus said it will never, not the smallest part of it, will ever be canceled. He did say he would fulfill it, which means complete its purpose. And once something has completed its purpose, it's no longer in play. That's why when you come into Christ, you're no longer under the law, it's going to say. Because Jesus fulfilled the purpose of the, what the law was trying to do. So, it's saying that you're married to the law. Now, instead of the law dying, the law doesn't die. It'll never die. You died to the law. Through the body of Christ, so that you might belong to another. To him who was raised from the dead, in order that we might bear fruit to God. So the Lord doesn't die, but you died. So if you don't see your death, you don't see your sin being paid. Can you see that? I'm just trying to just bolster the case, just so that you know without a shadow of a doubt that this is true. This is biblical uh, argument here. This is not my argument. You died, your sin was paid. Well, what about the law? Well, you died to the law so that you could belong to Jesus. You're either in Christ or you're in the prison of the law. Let me say that again. You're either in Jesus or you're in the law. You can't have Jesus and Moses. You've got to have just Jesus. And if you're in Jesus, you already died. Your sinful nature was taken away, was dealt with. All the legal indebtedness stood against you, was canceled at the cross, and the devil can no longer accuse you. That makes me say amen. For when we were in the realm of the flesh, the sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in us so that we bore fruit to death. That bearing of fruit is a picture of actually having children. So when you were married to the law, you had children to death. What does the law produce? Death. When you look at other scriptures, it says the working of the law is also called dead works. The only thing you can produce by you trying to be righteous by the law is death. But when you're married to Jesus... You produce life. The blockage is now gone. Now you're free to breathe easy. But now, by dying to once what bound us, what once bound us, we have been released from the law so that we serve in the new way of the Spirit and not in the old way of the written code. Amen. Let's go to the next verse there that I've got. It misses out a section about when you're not saved... You want to do good stuff, but you actually do bad stuff. And you want to avoid bad stuff and do good stuff, but you just end up doing all. And so it, this is where it's a very funny line. Paul says, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. I can't do what I really want to do. In my mind, I really want to serve God. I want to serve God's law. But my body is a body of flesh. He's like, oh, I don't know what to do. How do I come through this? Now, when a Christian reads Romans 7, they go, well, that's talking about me. It's not talking about you. It's talking about the unbeliever. Because the believer wants to come into relationship with God and really wants to do a good thing, but can't in its natural self. It's a body of death. Death cannot produce life. Can't produce towards God. So... He, he, he recaps a very comical, it's actually very sad, <laughs> but very comical uh, play on, I want to do this, but I can't do it. And I want to avoid bad, but I can't do it. So he says, so I find this, war, this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law, but I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. What a wretched man I am. He's saying as an unbeliever, even if I want to do good, I can't do good. 
Even if I want to avoid bad, I can't. It's, evil is right there with me. I am wrecked. There's nothing I can do. He says, who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? The purpose of the law is to make you to come to that question. Who's going to rescue me? If you really play the law out, you should come to, I can't do this. No matter how hard I try, sin, evilness is right there with me. Everything I touch turns to death. And the law exposes that in your life. And if you fully play out the law, and if there's very few people like Saul or Paul who played out the law like he should have, he was killing Christians. It was his, he was standing there while Stephen was being stoned to death. They were throwing their coats at his feet. He was presiding over the ceremony of killing Stephen. He, he went full out on the law. And because he did that, when he played the law out fully, he went, no one can rescue me from this. I tried the best that I could. I'm wretched. No hope for me. I need someone else to rescue me. This is why it is a wise thing. We are a grace church. We believe in grace. But here's the thing. When you preach to an unbeliever, often we try and preach grace to the unbelievers and the law to the Christians. You need to flip it. You need to preach grace to the Christians because we're in grace. Not all the time. You need to be sensitive. You need to be uh, emotionally intelligent. But sometimes what the unbeliever needs to hear is the law you don't have to do it ugly you don't do horrible but you have to see oh you you think you're so righteous you think you're getting to heaven because you're such a nice person you help the kids in africa now you're getting to heaven well the law says and then you use the ten commandments and when they realize even my good actions are bearing fruit to death i need someone to help me that's when jesus comes along What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Thanks be to God. Not me. Thanks be to me and my effort. His effort produced nothing. Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ. Next slide, Heather. Jesus Christ, our Lord. So then, I myself, in my mind, I'm a slave to God's law. But in my sinful nature, I'm a slave to the law of of sin. You are a slave. You were married to the law. You're in slavery. You're in bondage. There's nothing you can do. So you must come to who's going to rescue me. Next verse. Romans 8. Therefore there is now no condemnation. Everyone say no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus, because through Christ, this is so amazing, because through Jesus The law of the Spirit who gives life (sighs) has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the sinful flesh. How was the law powerless? Because every time I I try to do good, evil was right there with me. So I'm trying to do good. I know I should. The law makes it clear that I should do good. And every time I try it, the sinful nature makes me bear fruit to death. The law was powerless because it was weakened by the sinful flesh. God did it by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. He never sinned. So he came as a human being. This is, this is why the virgin birth is so important and understanding that Jesus was tempted in every way. You need to see the ways that you were tempted and failed were the ways that he was tempted and didn't fail. And he was successful in completing the law. He was the only one who was able to live up to the righteous requirements of the law. Jesus never broke the law once. And I don't care how clever you are and how wonderful you are, if you think that you broke none of the laws except this one little thing on one day, James and Galatians both say, if you break the law in one part, you break the whole thing. Everyone fell short of the law except Jesus. So the law was powerless, but the son wasn't. And he came in likeness in sinful flesh. So he was perfect. And then what did he do with his perfection? He offered on the altar of God. He spilled his blood so you could receive that same perfection that he resisted temptation in. And so we read in 2 Corinthians 5 that he became sin, that sin offering, so that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. 
When you see that, how can you ask the question, well, does my sin break relationship with God? Am I still in debt? How can you ask that question? Because the perfect Lamb of God paid for that sin. He didn't just pay for the sin, He became sin. You didn't just earn a little tag of righteousness, a certification, until the next time you sin. You became the righteousness of God. And so condemn sin in the flesh, in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us. This is crazy. Think about this. In order that the righteous requirements of the law. That means those 600 and so laws that were the perfect reflection of the best you could be on the planet. Do you know that every single one of the laws is met in us? When God looks at your record, he goes, okay, six, first six commandments, yeah, no problem. Seventh commandment, did they? And goes through the record, starts flipping through the pages. Did you lie? Did you steal? Did you commit adultery? No, 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 Lord, I never committed. Did you even look at a woman with lust in your eyes? Goes through all the record. Do you, when he looks at you as a believer, do you know what at the end of that, looking at that written record that stood against you, he goes, Big tick at the bottom of the list. Yep, completely righteous. <gasps> completely righteous? But I heard him mentioning specific laws. He's mentioned like 600 of them. Oh, yeah, you're completely righteous. And you go, but, but, but Lord, are you blind? No, no, I'm not blind. I see perfectly. But Lord, you, you know, and you start reminding God of all the sins that you did. He goes, uh, yeah, but I was never looking at your record. I was looking at Jesus' record. And Jesus' record was perfect. And if you're in Jesus, then when I look at your record, all the righteous requirements of the law are fulfilled. Tick, 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 tick. Hallelujah. Does your sin break relationship with God? Is there a blockage because you sinned? Not according to Scripture. Not according to truth. Not according to Jesus. You can believe your Pope, you can believe your pastor, you can believe the weird prophet that comes in town and says weird things. You can believe all of that. You can believe you need to repent if you want, but I'm telling you it's a choking hazard. Because Scripture, Jesus, what was the purpose to come and make you a little bit better in your behavior? Or was it to make you alive? You believe whatever you want to believe. You only access by faith, which is belief. You can upgrade your experience of breathing the life of God by just going, okay, God, I'm not going to rely on me. I'm going to rely on you because your work is better than my work. Amen. Okay, who might be fully met, the righteous requirements might be fully met in us, who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Ooh, okay, now you have to see, no, we're no longer under law, but the Spirit has to teach, now he's going to teach you the law. Let's go. I'm just missing out a section for time's sake, but you can read it in context. Go to the next slide there, Heather. Now look at this. This is why Romans 7 is talking about the person who's not a believer. Romans 8 is talking about the believer. It's going to say now, You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the Spirit. That is a state, not a work. You don't have to prove that you're in the Spirit. You just are in the Spirit if you're a believer. Sean, how can you say that? Well, let's just read. Just read it. Don't hate me. Don't hate me. Just read it. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but in the realm of the Spirit. If indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. See? If you sin, the Spirit leaves you. He's not in you. Are you dying? Whoa, whoa, hold on. Hold on. If the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. The Holy Spirit will never leave you and never forsake you. Because once you're in Christ, the Spirit of Christ lives in you. So once you come into Jesus, the Spirit comes into you. And that's done. That's a done deal. One and done. But if Christ is in you, watch this now. What about my sin? What about my sin? When I sin, when I sin, what about... Look at the... You know, if I kill someone in a car accident, I've got to live with that guilt. And Yeah, there's bad things that happen because you do bad things. But your status is righteous. Now look at how grace overcomes your sin. Where grace, where sin abounded, grace did all the more abound. The wages of sin is death. So death happens when you do bad stuff. But look at what grace does. It says, but if Christ is in you, 
then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, <gasps> see, 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 well, just watch. Even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of the spirit of His Spirit who lives in you. So even when you have an outworking of stupid behavior and sin and evilness and bad things, even when there's a death penalty, you see, even then, because you're in Christ and the Spirit's in you, that life of the Spirit will breathe through you at a greater level than all of the death you could produce in your body. Yes. Somebody say amen. amen. Oh, what debt do you have now? You don't have a debt. Yeah. No debt. He canceled the debt. Amen. You know, if you didn't teach somebody religion, they wouldn't need to hear this. They would just know this instinctually. It's religion that's complicated our airways. And so you need to undo the airways so you can do... <sighs> Just easy breathing. Oh, easy breathing. I don't have to be in fear about my death, about my sin, about the bad thing. You know, I heard that God forgives me my sins, but at what point does that forgiveness run out? Is it only when I repent? Is it after three days when I feel better? I feel guilty. Well, you're not guilty, even if you feel guilty. That's just your feelings. I feel hungry, so I eat. But look at me. Am I hungry? Am I hungry? I just feel hungry, so I get fat. If I stopped listening to my feelings, I wouldn't be so fat. There are so many fat Christians walking around because they feel guilty. Well, stop listening to your feelings and start listening to the Spirit. Because He doesn't accuse you. And He gives you life, even if there's bad stuff that happens. Somebody say amen. Last verse in last stretch of verses in Romans 8. This is just, uh, next slide. This is a same chapter. I, I encourage you to go and read this. This is the most life-giving uh, chapter in Romans. This is so beautiful. Uh, sometimes I just wish we read the Bible, just the Bible, because uh, I love it so much. But I think I talk too much, so I'm learning. I'm learning. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? Has God chosen you? Amen. Who's going to bring a charge against you? Amen. You do something bad, who's going to bring a charge against you? If God be for you, who can be against you? He disarmed the principalities and powers. He took away your debt. Who's going to be? You just committed a sin. If God be for me, who be against me? Come and make your charge. You see who my defense lawyer is. If he didn't give up his son, how would he not graciously give up, give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies we're so often in the business of justifying ourselves. Yes. Well, I didn't know, and I thought this would happen. You know, maybe if God could just see my angle. Stop trying to justify yourself, Christian. You don't need to justify it. It's God who justifies, yes. not you. Who then is the one who condemns? Everyone say this together. No one. No one. Who condemns? No one. When you feel condemned, is it God condemning you? No, He justifies you. When you feel condemned, you are agreeing with the enemy to block your own airways, and you don't need to. Jesus Christ, who died more than that, was raised to life, who is at the right hand of God, is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? What trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? And as, as it is written, for your sake, we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors. Through him who loved us. For I'm convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons, nor present, nor future, nor any powers, nor either height, nor depth, nor anything else in creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ 
Jesus. Let me ask you the question. How powerful do you think your sin is now? Do you think your, power, your, your sin is that powerful to separate you from the love of God? The next time you sin on purpose, because I know Christians qualify this. I, I, can, I can hear the same voices in my head. I want to say, your sin doesn't count. God never counts your sin against you. And I want to go, yeah, but you shouldn't sin. And what about you? You've got to be a good advertisement for the world. I hear all the same things. But I'm just going to say the truth. Your sin is not counted against you. Your sin is not counted against you. Well, should we just keep on sinning? Ah, you've heard grace. If you're asking that question, you've heard something. Something has confronted you that made you think about the consequences of grace. And there are answers to that question in Romans 6. But the answers to those questions do not stay, do not change your state of righteousness. Your state is perfect once for all, forever, no matter how much sin you can. You are perfectly righteous before the Father. There is nothing that can stand against you. Nothing can condemn you. No one can get in the way between you and the life of God. I don't care what you've done. Let me say this. God doesn't care what you've done. Because God's already paid for it. Nothing can stand against you. And it is God who justifies. No one can condemn you. Okay, I really, I really want to nail this home. I know I should end now. I know I'm preaching too long, but I really want to nail it. I really want to nail this. Let's go to the next verse there, Heather. What shall we say? That Abraham, our forefather, uh, according to the flesh, discovered in this matter. That's so weirdly worded. Let me read that again. What shall we say then that Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, discovered in this matter. What did Abraham figure out? If in fact Abraham was justified by works, it is God who justified. Who is it that condemns? No one. If, just, if Abraham was justified by works, he had something to boast about, but not before God, just before men. If he, what he did with his own human hands, he's going to talk about circumcision, was so clever, he could boast. I've got it. I've figured it out. I've climbed the mountain. I've earned my righteousness. He had something to boast about. Not before God, though. What does Scripture say? Abraham, everyone say this word. That's the key. Not work. Believed. Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Notice, sin gives you a debt mindset. Righteousness gives you a credit mindset i wonder how many of us are walking along feeling debt to god or debt to others what are we focusing on our sin or our righteousness when you focus on righteousness you will be concerned with uh, consumed with oh god you've abundantly blessed me let me become a blessing to others when you have nothing to give most often it's because you've been focusing on sin and how inadequate you are yeah. and how bad you are and you're hoping that god doesn't beat you too hard the next time you pray that's the mindset of Christians. But Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now to the one who works, wages are not credited as a gift, but as an obligation. If you work towards God, God owes you, right? That's the logic he's playing out here. God doesn't owe you anything. God's gracious, but he's not a fool. He doesn't owe you anything. Just because you do something good doesn't mean he has to give you a prize now, give you a wage. That's how some Christians treat God. See, God, I didn't sin this week. So they put their, their coin of self-righteousness into the slot machine and say, okay, God, give me a gift because I was a good boy. No, God has already credited your account with righteousness. He's already given you everything he can give you. He can't give you anything else because he's given it all to you. He gave you his son. But if you think that he hasn't given something to you because it's waiting on your behavior, then it's no longer a gift, it's now a work. So to the one who works, wages are not credited as a gift, but as an obligation. However, to the one who does not work, but trusts God, who justifies who? Those who are trying really hard and really close to holiness. No. But trust God who justify the ungodly. Their faith is credited as righteousness. 
David says the same thing when he speaks of the blessedness of the one whom God credits righteousness apart from works. Does your sin create separation from you and God? God is justifying the ungodly, the dirty, the evil, the bad behavior guys through faith. And now David's going to confirm with Abraham about those who get credited with righteousness apart from works. Let's look at the condition of apart from works. Blessed are those whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. So Abraham received the blessing because he believed and God made him righteous. And David said, blessed is the man who doesn't receive based on what they've done, apart from works. And then specifically says, let's go back for a second. Heather. Blessed are those whose transgressions are forgiven. Why is sin such a big problem for the Christian? It's not a big problem for God. Because he blesses by forgiving transgressions. And he covers over sins. That was the whole purpose of the whole the ark, the temple system. Do you know that was the whole purpose? Once a year they would get in, kill some animals, sprinkle the blood over the mercy seat. The whole purpose was was for forgiveness. Israel was meant to march around the desert and move into the promised land by looking at forgiveness happen before their very eyes. They were not spilling their own blood. It was the blood of a perfect lamb. That practice ceremony was meant to condition them to the truth of God dying on their behalf. And they got mixed up in the minutia of all of the little intricacies and they missed out on what Jesus did for them. That's why you've got to clearly see Jesus being portrayed as crucified. Blessed are those whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Next slide. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord will never count against them. When you believe that you are righteous and you access that by faith, finished. That's it. You now enter into the blessing. God will never count your sin against you. He credits your account with righteousness. I keep on saying the same thing. Because I'm hoping some truth is confronting those recesses of our minds where we've thought, well, you know, I I received God's forgiveness, but maybe it's not that far. Maybe I've got to try hard before. No, the moment you're saved, he's forgiven. He already forgave you before, uh, before you were born, you were forgiven. You just had to access that forgiveness. How do you access? By trying really hard, by your intention, by repentance. No, by faith. And you receive that by faith. You're blessed, 100%. Airways open. That make sense? Okay, was that the last scripture, Heather? Let's go, let's just read it. Let's read it. Yeah. It was not through the law that Abraham and his offspring received the promise that he would be the heir of the world, but through the righteousness that comes by faith. Everyone say, righteousness that comes by faith. For if those who depend on the law are heirs... Faith means nothing, and the promise is worthless. If you depend on the law, your faith means nothing. Everything that you receive from God, it goes down to zero on the stock market. The promise and faith go to zero. Why? Because the law brings wrath. If you rely on the law, you are going to fail. And if you fail, what has God got to give you but wrath? But where there is no law, there is no transgression. Jesus said the law will never pass away. Yeah, the law will never pass away. But he completed the law and then in him, he canceled the written code that was against you. He canceled your debt. He fulfilled the law. And so you died to the law so you could belong to Jesus. Now you no longer belong to the law. You belong to Jesus. So if you go back to, that's why we keep on using the words, we go back to, go back, go back to the law. Why can you go back to something unless you've already left it? That's what the true, true biblical repentance is leaving the law. You're changing your mind and what you have to do. I no longer have to be righteous by my own work, by works. I now get righteous by faith. That's repentance. When you go back to the law, that's not Repentance. That's (laughs) re-repentance. That's (laughs) unrepentance. Don't go back to the law, because the law brings wrath. Just stay breathing. 
But if there is no law, there is no transgression. So I died, so I'm no longer attached to the law. That husband of the law, it never died, but I died. Now I belong to Jesus. He's my husband. And now he makes me righteous. Therefore, the promise comes by faith so that it may be by grace and guarantee to all Abraham's offspring. Not only to those who have the law, but those who have faith in Abraham. He's not, he's saying, what he's qualifying here, just for a second, is it's not just the Jews, it's also the Gentiles. And so we have access by grace. This is what I like to call the grace guarantee. The guarantee is you can access all of the life of God by grace and grace alone. If you try and access by anything else, it's not guaranteed. But if you access by grace, it's guaranteed to all of us. He is the father of, of us all. So I've got a closing demonstration I want to show to prove this or to explain this further. In the garden, there was a tree of life. And Adam had relationship to God through the tree of life. He had access. The, the airways were open. <sighs> he could just breathe easy. He was walking in God's pleasure, in God's goodness, in God's favor. He wasn't hiding. He wasn't ashamed of his nakedness. There was no sin, so nothing had to be covered. So he didn't have to be covered. And so he has perfect access. And what happens is, sin came along through Adam, first Adam, and sin severed that relationship. Hopefully sin is strong enough here. Sin severed the relationship between man and God. And so God, God did this. You've, you've got to see this clearly in Scripture. God put an angel outside of the garden, threw the man out, and said, we don't want you to have access to the tree of life. Otherwise, you might become like us. God talking about himself. I don't want you to become like us. Because if you become like us, having access to eternal life in a state of sin, I can't deal with sin anymore. Because I want to bring sin to death. I want to close the door on sin. I don't want sin to exist into eternity. And so he cut man off from eternal life because man was in sin. And most people look at that and look at that as a punishment. That wasn't so much a punishment as it was grace. Because God had a redemptive plan in Jesus. And so he wanted to connect man back to his tree of life so they could breathe and access everything. But not in the state of sin, in the state of life. For the righteous will live by faith. So it's that life that he wants to bring us. So what the law did, because there was now a separation from the time of Adam until the time of Abraham. And in fact, even to the time of Moses, there was the separation um, but man didn't, wasn't always aware that there was a separation because they didn't always live in the life. They couldn't contrast it to the truth of life. And so there were a few people who accessed God's life, and you can read them in the beginning of Genesis. But by the time Moses came along, God wanted to make it clear that there was a separation between God and man. And so, Seamus, will you come and be the law for me? And so the magnifying glass of the law came, and the magnifying glass looked at my end. Would you look at this? Do you think this is connected to the life of God? No. Wait, 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 hold, hold on. Give me another try. Give me another try. Uh, I'm trying really hard. I really mean well. I'm trying very hard. Look again, look again. No. Wait, 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 wait. Hold on, hold on. Let me get my breath. I'm going to try really hard not to sin this week. I'm going to do everything good that I can. And if I try really hard, shut up, Bonnie, don't speak to you anymore. Get away from me, Sammy. Stop speaking to me, people. I'm going to try really hard to get righteous. You know what? Let me pray and fast. If I pray and fast, maybe I'll connect. Are you ready? Remember, the law is God-given. The law is holy and righteous. As an unbeliever, no. In first Adam, no. <laughs> As an unbeliever, I'm not connected. You are right as a believer. You are 100% right. In first Adam, we, God separated us from the life of God. As, as an unbeliever, I know what you're saying. You, you are actually more right than me. But I'm going backwards. 
So in first Adam, sin broke the relationship between me and God. I no longer had access in first Adam. If you read Romans 5, it said that the one trespass brought condemnation to the many. And so condemnation was you are guilty. You broke relationship with God by your actions. And so the law came along in Moses to show that separation. And if I try really, 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 really hard. Am I there? Am I, am I righteous? Because I'm trying. I, I made nine of the ten commandments. Am I there? Okay, hold on a second. Okay. Christians, don't look at me, law. Uh, brothers and sisters in Christ. Am I there? Do I, look, do I look righteous enough on a Sunday morning, but I don't show you truly what's going on in the closet? Am I righteous? No, no, no. I really serve God well. I read my Bible this week and I prayed. You see, I'm, I'm, I'm righteous. That's what religion does. It pretends it's righteous, righteous for a time, but it's not truly righteous. If Abraham thought he could boast because of circumcision, he could maybe boast in front of you, but he couldn't boast before God. Because as the law comes in, it's the perfect righteous requirement. And it recognizes. That's not, that's not a proper connection. <laughs> <laughs> I'd rather not tie another knot. That's what righteousness by the law is. It is a, an attempt when someone tries to get righteousness by the law, it is an attempt to undo the sin that separated you from God. And you can't undo the sin that separated you from God. I like to think about it this way. Imagine you wanted to step up onto this chair, but you had to pull yourself up onto it. The harder you pull by yourself, even if you had a really strong arm, and you could pull, the harder you pull, the more you're pulling down. That's what Romans 7 is all about. The harder you try and get saved the more evil you're going to do. And so you can't pick yourself up. You need someone else to rescue you. And the law recognizes that by perfection. The law is perfect. But the law couldn't make you perfect. Hebrews 7. And so now we're left in a conundrum. Under Moses, the law has done its job to show you, I'm a wretched man. There's nothing I can do. Now I need someone else to come rescue me. Judah, would you come and rescue me? So, Judah came in the form, I mean, Jesus came in the form of a man. This is Jesus. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus, for what you did for me. He was not sinful. He was born of a virgin. He was tempted in every way, yet without sin. And he came to perfectly fulfill all the righteous requirements of the law. And so on my behalf, not me, because the more I tried, the more I realized I was disconnected from the life of God. So Jesus came in as first, like first Adam originally had relationship. He came in as last Adam. And so he took the, can you just come be a stand in? Hide your law, hide your law. Okay, now let's turn around to the camera. Okay. And so, when I... Just hold this side for me. Come to stand this side. Come stand this side. When I couldn't make it, when I couldn't connect with God... What are you doing, Jesus? <laughs> stand back, stand back. Stand back. <laughs> when I couldn't connect with God... <laughs> Jesus, you're supposed to be perfect. <laughs> What Jesus did is he came along and he said, okay, okay, okay. Wow. <laughs> Jesus, don't, you are the tree of life. Jesus said, okay, I'm going to come in as a substitute. You can't do it. So Jesus came and took my end of the bargain. Come take this end, Jesus. Stood on my behalf and he connected the two perfectly. And now Jesus, as a man, remember, not as God. He already had perfection as God. As a man came to the planet and he undid Leave that, Jesus. He undid all the trouble that I caused, and he connected to God as a man on my behalf. Now, my question to you is, when on the cross he paid for my debt, 
in effect, I was asleep. I was not part of the covenant between the son and the father. So how do I access the life that he's now winning as a man? This is how I access. Give me, I'm going to do it. I'm going to, I'm going to try. I'm going to try. Get away, Jesus. I don't need you anymore. Ah! I can't make the connection anymore. That's what most Christians are taught to do. They taught I have to now go back to the law to make myself righteous. And if I pray enough and I fast enough and I don't sin enough and I give enough and I do enough, eh, what is enough? When I do enough, now I can make the law. And we push Jesus out of the way. And so Jesus comes and he performs the work perfectly. Now, how do I receive it? This is how I receive it. Not by working, trying to make the connection myself. I go by faith. Stand over here, Jesus. I die. To my attempt, I let go of my end of the bargain. I go, I can't do it. I let go. I say, Jesus, thank you. And by faith, I receive everything that he did, all of the right. I just receive it by faith. Now the promise is made perfect because he's doing it and I'm receiving it. I'm more than a conqueror because I didn't do this. Jesus did it on my behalf. Even if I tried, I couldn't do it. And now the pray, amen. Now the now the promise has value because Abraham received it by faith. He received it. So before Abraham received it by faith, he didn't do anything to receive the promise. He just received it and believed it. And when he believed it, he was said, "You're righteous." The perfect connection between the tree of life and you. You have received it all by faith, not by doing anything. Now I can, oh, <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> okay, you guys can sit down. You can sit down. Thank you. <laughs> well done, Jesus. See, people are trying to bring honor to Jesus by working the law of Moses. Does that bring honor to Jesus? What brings honor to Jesus is leaving the law of Moses and saying, I understand the purpose of the law was to magnify the separation between me and God, to magnify how much I owed my debt, how much I was condemned, to magnify my separation, the distance between me and the Father. That was the purpose of the law. And you should honor the law for that. Thank God for the law. But you don't honor Jesus by staying in that place. You honor Jesus by going, Jesus, thank you that you stood in the gap, that you spilled your blood, that you connected me to the Father through your perfect work. Thank you, Jesus, that although you knew no sin, you became a sin offering for me, that I might become the righteousness of God in you. Thank you, Jesus. That's how you honor him. You know that the best way you can honor Moses is by honoring Jesus. Because Moses was faithful as a builder. As a servant in God's house. But Jesus was faithful as a builder. When you honor Jesus, Moses goes, wow, I'm so grateful. He saw the riches of Christ. And he forgo all the, all the, the riches of Egypt for the sake of Christ, it says in Hebrews 11. So when you honor Jesus, you also honor Moses. You're not disrespecting Moses by saying, I'm not under the law. No, you're honoring Moses. When you go, Jesus, I honor you. Because that's the one he longed to look for. Can you imagine what it was like on that mountain when Moses and Elijah were talking to Jesus? Do you know what a privilege that was for Moses? To talk to the incarnate living Jesus clothed in glory on the very mountain that I believe Elijah and Moses were hidden in when they saw the glory. Do you know what a privilege that was? Moses must be so offended when he hears that Christians are going back to him when they've got the availability of Jesus. He must be weeping in pain to go, come on, guys, I was aiming towards him. Why are you aiming towards me? Go to Jesus. Jesus, we honor you. We honor you for what you did on the cross for us. Jesus, we thank you that what you did was not for you. It was for us. Thank you that the payment you paid, not one cent of that went to your own bill. It went to the list of sins that we had committed. Thank you that you canceled all of that debt. That you disarmed the deceiver. You disarmed the devil. 
You took away every accusation at the cross. Thank you, Father, that you stand as one who justifies us. One, as one who confirms that all the righteous requirements of the law are fully met in us because of what your son did. Thank you for the holiness that you've placed us in. That you present us as holy and blameless in your sight. Thank you that you lavish on us with great grace all the gifts and kindness and favor that you have on us. Because you loved us. That you gave yourself for us. Thank you, Spirit. Thank you. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that you couldn't wait to come and dwell with us. To confirm these truths to us. That you didn't leave us as orphans. Thank you. And Lord, anywhere in our lives that we have come to a conclusion that we have to perform or earn or deserve, or we think how somehow that the work that Jesus did on the cross wasn't good enough, somehow our sin is greater than the sacrifice. Lord, I pray that you would help us to repent and come back to the goodness that you produced on the cross. Thank you for that fruit of life. And that we can come into the freedom of knowing we don't have to earn or deserve. We don't have to impress. We don't have to try our hardest. That we receive this by faith and faith alone. Thank you that your grace guarantees that you are able to favor us. And that we are able to receive that favor by faith. Thank you. Thank you that we stand in grace and not in the law. Thank you. So we just honor you, Jesus. We honor you. We honor you. Honor you. Holy Spirit, remind us this week of what Jesus did for us. We just thank you. Everyone just say thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus.